good morning to you. And uh, I'm sorry things didn't work out so that we could be live with you this morning, but for some reason, uh, number one, I forgot to get it set up earlier, and number two, when I tried to set it up, it wouldn't take me to where I need to be for Facebook Live. So here we are. We are Memorex rather than live today. So thank you all for your patience, all of you who are here. Uh, it is good to have everybody here. We're going to pray, and then we're going to carry on with some announcements and uh, carry on with the message. <clears throat> and we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper as well, as you can see in front of me. So. Lord Jesus, please um, bless the words that I have prepared this morning. It's all about the words today, Lord. It's all about our communication. It's all about your kindness being revealed to the world through the words that we say. So Lord, please help me as I communicate. You are the one who's truly doing the work. I'm just a physical process, but your Holy Spirit is the one that is carrying the meaning through. So please make that so. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the prayers and the praises, and uh, we look forward to the rest of our day together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> okay, I need some more water. All right. And for some reason, my mic is all scratchy. We'll <coughs> do the best we can there. How's everybody? All right, good. I see thumbs up. That's good. All right, nice. Yeah, they're popping up all over the room. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Well, let's talk about some uh, announcements, some things that we have going on. Um, thank you. To, I'm going back to last weekend, and we've already said this, but I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to everybody who assisted with the Wave Food Drive, those of you who were here as volunteers, and some of you who were here as volunteers for the food drive also were working in the gardens at the same time. And so it was like double ministry going on there. So thank you for that. Um, I've been talking about um, our gardens, uh, the the churchyard needing some attention, and many of you have come out to take care of that, and uh, that makes everybody very happy. So thank you. Things are looking better outside. Much appreciated. And we kind of just want to keep that in mind. So I'll probably fuss about that at some time in the future as well. Today, big day today, today there's not going to be any soup Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. We often do soup immediately following the service. Instead, what we're doing is we're having a straight up potluck meal, uh, sort of an early dinner. We're doing a three o'clock uh, meal because of the time change and darkness and all that jazz. It's a little weird, the time's a little weird, but if you're like me, chances are you can pretty much eat any time. So, you know, this is gonna be one of those moments. So three o'clock today and um, uh, bring whatever you're going to bring. We'll eat what you bring. We're not trying to recreate a Thanksgiving dinner or anything like that. Um, and um, so whether you're bringing a main dish or a side dish or a salad or a dessert or whatever it is, we're just all going to enjoy it together. And that is today, 3 o'clock. If you've been downstairs at all, it looks lovely. Uh, Sue and, I don't know, whoever, lady and the ladies made set things up really nicely downstairs. It looks really nice. So that's today, that's three o'clock. Um, <clears throat> we have been engaged in what I'm calling a season of prayer. We scheduled five meetings for prayer over the last uh, few weeks. Um, we're meeting at 5 p.m. on Wednesdays. I know that's a weird time, but every time we choose is weird in some way. So 5 p.m. and uh, so we have uh, November 8th and November 15th still out there, please feel free to come and join us. We meet right here in the sanctuary. We pull a few chairs out and we sit around in the center and we pray for the church. We pray for the community. We pray for the world at large. Um, we pray for our families, for our own kids. And, um, and um, we've seen good things come from these prayer times in the past. And so we are trusting God for more of that blessing. Uh, so come and join us. And you know we've consistently had a good set of people here for that. So the more the merrier, though. Book study group is still happening. 
Uh, what's so amazing about Grace? One more meeting, November 14th, 3.30, home of Vi Rabbits. That's still, yes, Vicki? It's still going. We're going to be talking about what we're going to be continuing. Okay, okay. All right. We're going to do it. Okay, so book group may continue. Um, and if you have a book to recommend, talk to Vicki. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, I will say that also, and, and I had it on a slide up here before, but Nancy and Elena have been having a Bible study, a little Bible study on John, on the Gospel of John. And they are not, this isn't a private affair. They'd be so happy to have you join them if you want to join them. It's happening immediately after the worship service on any on Sundays, okay? So feel free to sit down and join them and be a part of that discussion. So that's going on too. And I finally remembered to say it out loud. So that, pat me on the head for that. Um, we've got, um, we had, uh, let's see. Yeah, this last Wednesday we had a board meeting. That was good. And uh, we're set up for um, December and things coming up in the future. Um, this year plays out a little weirdly in that um, the 26th of November, uh, we're gonna celebrate, we're gonna, that's gonna be our Thanksgiving Sunday, and we're gonna be um, um, thinking about Thanksgiving. We're also gonna have uh, Dave and Jean Andrianoff with us who are gonna give us an update on their ministry, so that's gonna be on the 26th. On the 19th, as I already said, Doug and Cora are gonna be with us. And, um, and then it's Christmas time after that. So I'm just giving you an early warning that hanging of the greens, the decorating of the church, the prepping of the church to celebrate the coming of Emmanuel is Saturday, December 2nd. Saturday, December 2nd. Uh, and 10 o'clock is our usual time. And um, we're going to be talking about the, getting the tree up in the air as well, hope, ideally the Friday before that. So that's still coming. Budget planning meeting Wednesday, December 13th, and the board meeting immediately following also on the 13th. There we go. Ah, no, here's the thing I want to talk to you about. Okay, all of those announcements out of the way. I uh, want to create, uh, uh, and I've done this in the past, I haven't done it for a couple of years, I want to create uh, another little gratitude-related slideshow. And I want you to participate in it with me. We've done this before. I want you to go through your digital photos, and I want you to, you can bring them to me on a flash drive, you can send them to me via email, send me some photos of things in your life that you are grateful for. Um, now, now, it would be lovely if you sent me individual photos of every one of your grandchildren. <laughs> That's not necessarily what I'm looking for. <laughs> And I might not be able to get all of them in there for some of you. Um, so so think, think big and beautiful things that you are grateful for, and maybe small little things too. And people are fine. People, I'm just kidding about, about grandchildren. But um, send me uh, uh, some photos of things that you're grateful for, and I'm going to take those, and I'll put them together with some photos that I have, and uh, create, we'll create a beautiful thing to help us see in a new way all the good gifts that God brings to us, okay? So that'll be for the 26th. So start thinking about that now. There we go. Any other announcements that need to be made? Okay. <clears throat> good enough. Let us, I'm going to read to you, read from Ephesians chapter 4 again. And the reason I do this, the reason I read you these large passages is because I think it's very valuable. I think it's valuable for us to hear the scripture, especially the letters, the same way the first Christians heard them, read aloud together, so everybody could think about it. So here we go, Ephesians 4.20, and uh, on to 5.2. But you did not learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard him and been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God, I wish it would stop doing that. 
which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, ridding yourselves of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. The one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good, so that he'll have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there's any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. That's our text for this morning, verse 29. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice of God as a fragrant aroma. There we go. And there we are. All right. <clears throat> This is kind of a big deal, okay? So we'll do a little quick review just so we all know where we are, um, and then we'll get right to it, because it's all about words. It's all about words. Um, in Ephesians 5.1, we are told, uh, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So as I've been saying to you over the last few weeks, this is an ongoing message throughout Ephesians. It, it says over and over again that we are to represent God to the world. It tells us that we're to mature into the fullness of God. That is, if you could live long enough, the idea Paul is talking about here is if you could live long enough that you would grow up to be able to reflect all the godness of God to the world. We're at the same time uh, told to mature into the fullness of Christ. That somehow, again, if you could live long enough, you would grow up in such a way that you would reflect all of Christ to the world. Now, we're not saying that you're becoming gods, not anything like that, but just that you are a mirror. You have become a better and better mirror of all the goodness of God, that, and you can spread it further into the world. We're put, told to put on the new self, which is created in God's likeness. So we're to put on God's likeness. See, we're supposed to be imitators of God. And one of the things we've been talking about in all of this, one of the things that we need to be imitating is God's kindness. God is unutterably kind to us. And we're to be imitations of the compassion and the forgiveness and the sacrificial love and, very important, the kindness of God. Now, God is kind by his very nature. For us, eh, not so much. Kindness is a choice of the will for us. Kindness is an act of Holy Spirit-empowered self-control. To put somebody else's happiness, somebody else's well-being ahead of our own, that is, that's an act of will. In acts of kindness, we subject ourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. That's Ephesians 5.21. And in this way, we imitate God and his kindness. So, we stop lying to each other. And in so doing, we imitate God's kindness. We dismiss our anger before the day is out. Be angry, but do not sin. That imitates God's kindness. And, as we talked about the other week, we intentionally work so that we will have something to share with the one who has need. That also is reflecting God's kindness into the world. And there's one more here, one more thing, one of this little set of directives, one more little directive for the imitating of the kindness of God, and it's all about our words. Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there's any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, 
Say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now, while this directive is primarily about censoring our spoken word, it is safely applied to all sorts of words. We are not stretching too far to say that this, this comment, this directive from Paul can be applied to written words and spoken and texted and posted and chanted and picket signed and broadcast and published and billboarded and emailed and blogged and, and, and that thing formerly known as Twitter that I don't even know what it is now. It's X or something. X, do you, I don't even know what it does. Do you X someone when you send a message? I don't know what it is. Twitter, what used to be Twitter. The Greek for unwholesome is sapras. Sapras. Sapras means rotten. means putrid. It means corrupt. It means impure. I don't know. Unwholesome may be a bit mild. It's accurate, but it may be a bit mild because all the other definitions are that bad. Putrid, impure, corrupt, that kind of thing. So, obscenities. Vulgar speech, slanderous and contemptuous talk, rude or demeaning words, none of that should be coming out of our mouths if we're an imitator of God. Now, of course, free speech is a cornerstone of our cultural identity. But recently, our culture has popularly redefined free speech to mean I'm free to publicly say absolutely anything I want about anyone or anything. And if you tell me that I can't say absolutely anything I want about anyone or anything, then you are curbing my free speech. Many, including a lot of folks who identify as Christians, would like to see politically correct speech taken behind the barn and shot. And some of those same folks have developed an affinity for anybody who says what he thinks. And usually the person who says what they think, uh, usually that means something vulgar or slanderous or contemptuous. So if you love Jesus and you intend to reflect God's kindness into the world, then obviously unfiltered, vulgar, derisive expression is absolutely off limits to you in every means of expression. Instead, your communication, as our text says, should give grace. Paul tells the Colossians the same thing. Remember, Colossians and Ephesians have a lot of the same content. They were sent to do different sets of people. Colossians uh, 4, 6. Come on. There we go. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So grace in our speech doesn't mean that we don't defend our faith in Christ. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't say hard things when hard things are required. And again, I'm bothered by this, but I can't quite, I can't quite make it stop for a second. If I could stop moving, what are the chances? Uh, anyway, grace doesn't mean that we don't defend the faith. Grace in our speech doesn't mean that we don't say hard things. But we name Jesus as Lord of our language as well as our life. So uh, 1 Peter 3.15, one of my favorite verses. In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. So there's the Lordship of Jesus. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. James, whom I love. I love the little letter of James. He's a good friend of mine. There was a time in my life when I had the entire book of James memorized. James says, uh, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Words, especially written ones, are easily misunderstood. And if you do much communication via email, you know what I'm talking about, right? 
Uh, a man whose wife was mad at him decided to apologize by sending her some flowers. He, he just, he was trying to keep it so simple. Surely he could write something where nothing would go wrong. He, so he wrote two sentences, I'm sorry and I love you. Those were the sentences. But when the flowers arrived, one period was missing. So the note said, I'm sorry I love you. You see how easy things can go wrong? And because words are easily misunderstood, they can be dangerous. Like the blacksmith teaching his apprentice, saying, I'm going to bring the horseshoe from the fire, and I'm going to lay it on the anvil, and when I nod my head, you hit it with the hammer. <laughs> what? Can, what was that, boss? Can you say it again? When I nod my head, you hit it with the hammer. Short, short blacksmith career. Words, of course, are linguistic symbols. Words are symbols for thoughts, but they're much more than that. All of us know that words can wound and words can crush the human spirit. We hear that old rhyme about sticks and stones, and we know that it's a lie. Because send the message, send the message that someone is stupid or worthless long enough, and it can destroy them. Names hurt, words hurt. But as our text says, the power of words works the other way too. Words are simply powerful, both ways. 429, second half of the verse. If there's any good word for edification, according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. Words can bring healing to heart and mind and body. You, this, this is testified to throughout both Testaments, Old Testament and New. Proverbs uh, 16 says, A pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Proverbs 25 says, A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Um, this happened just recently, and it was, I remember it, be, I, I made, I intentionally remembered it because I knew it would be good for talking about this. Rebecca was in Seattle, and she, while walking back to the ferry, she ended up walking behind a younger woman who had, was, had a, a very nice outfit. She was really well put together. And um, after walking behind her for a few blocks, an opportunity came for Rebecca to speak. And Rebecca said, to this stranger, she doesn't know who this is, she said, your outfit is so cute. And this made the young woman very pleased. It was obvious in her demeanor that Rebecca had said a thing that just gave her great blessing. She said, I don't look too much like a kindergarten teacher. And Rebecca said, no, no, you look very put together. And the woman walked off, happy, delighted to have those words, words aptly spoken, like apples of gold in a setting of silver. What if, here's an aside, what if you could do that for one person every day? Just one. The big point here is that words are not benign, and we need to remember that. They can be full of grace that heals, or they can be full of poison that kills, and, and the little New Testament letter of James expands at length upon what Paul is talking about here, about the potential damage of unwholesome words and the need for grace-filled words. So we're going to begin with the fact that controlling words is hard, okay? It just is. Controlling our words is hard. James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So right here, James is, he's kind of making a wry comment. He's kind of joking a little bit. He's saying anybody who could consistently control his speech must be perfect in every other part of his life. Because if, uh, if self-control were to wash over us like a wave, the tongue would be the last thing to get damp. The tongue is elusive. The tongue is unruly. It does not want to be controlled. When Isaiah, of course we sang about Isaiah a little while ago, when Isaiah senses God's presence in the temple, 
His first thought is, I'm unclean. I'm in the presence of God and I'm unclean. And, he's, and I just want to point this out. It's not because he doesn't think, oh, I'm unclean because of sex sin of some kind. He doesn't think I'm unclean because he's been stealing. He doesn't think he's unclean because of anger. But he says, it's because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. It's the words, it's the words that come to him as the thing that marks him as unclean. Whatever other sins Isaiah was dealing with in his life. Isaiah's sense of doom shows that he understands the big problem we humans have with unwholesome words. And like I said earlier, it takes a burning hot coal taken by an angel from the, from the altar and pressed to his lips to forgive his sin and make him pure. According to Hebrew wisdom, our speech and our heart are synchronized. What comes out of our mouth and the thoughts within us, they're synchronized together. Uh, Proverbs 10, 20 um, equates heart and tongue. Uh, no, yeah, that's right, Proverbs 10, 20. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. That's a Hebrew, Hebrew parallelism. Tongue and heart are basically being equated there. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is of little value. Proverbs 17, 20, a little clearer on this. One whose heart is corrupt does not prosper. One whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. The tongue and the heart are connected. So the words anybody speaks into the universe reveal the content of that person's heart. Think about that. And um, if you don't want to think about it, uh, what you can do is you can get yourself a parrot. If you get a parrot and it's a good talker, like ours was, this is not our, our parrot never looked this good. Our parrot Max was kind of, he looked disreputable his entire life. And I got lots of stories about Max. I'm not going to tell you all those now. I can tell them to you tonight if you want to hear them. But um, here's the thing we learned about ourselves owning Max. Max could imitate every single one of us in the family. He, he heard every word that we said, and he spoke every word that we said aloud back to us. We heard our tones of voice. We heard the way we spoke to our children. We heard the way the kids spoke to us. We heard it all, and it caused us to choose to change some things, because it wasn't good. Not all of it. Anyway, Max, Gary, that's what Max should have looked like. Maybe that's what he looked like on a, on a good day. Now I got all excited talking about Max, and I lost my place. But as hard as it is to control words, as hard as that may be, Jesus still demands that we do it. Just because it's hard doesn't mean he doesn't expect it of us. Uh, Matthew 12, 36. This is a verse that should call it, cause everybody to come up short. I tell you that everyone, this is Jesus saying, I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. And that would include every post posted and every tweet tweeted and every text texted and every email emailed. For by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned. Please take note there. By your words, you will be both acquitted, so marked as righteous, or condemned, marked as unrighteous. Your words can give either one of those. That's a big deal. Let's go on to the next point here. The damage from unwholesome words is huge. The damage from unwholesome words like Paul is talking about in Ephesians is huge. And remember, we're talking about putrid, corrupt speech. Um, James says, so also the tongue, it's a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. So here's some names for you. Here's some people to consider. Um, Lennon, Manson, Jim Jones, David Koresh, 
And certainly, if you don't remember any of those others, you might remember this one, Adolf Hitler. All these men use their considerable verbal talent to manipulate people to do horrible, insane things. Hitler alone is considered responsible for the deaths of somewhere, I mean, estimates vary between 46 and 60 million people, and his primary weapon was words. The words these wicked men flung out into the universe inspired great evil that brought fire and death and destruction to dozens and thousands and millions of people all over the world. Here's what the scripture says about the wicked and their words. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted, Psalm 5.9. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Psalm 10, 7, his mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. But you don't have to be a megalomaniac or a false messiah to wreak havoc with words. Um, in a poem about the cruel words of another woman, Emily Dickinson, who I particularly like, as a poet, Emily Dickinson, wrote this. She wrote, there she is. She dealt her pretty words like blades, as glittering they shone, and everyone unbared a nerve or wantoned with a bone. Words cut deep, that's the point. And her poetry there reflects a bit of ancient poetry from the Psalms. Psalm 64 says, Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from the plots of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim cruel words like deadly arrows. And with Wi-Fi and the internet, words can stab and hurt from across the globe or across the room. Um, Herman and Trixie had some people over for the first time since the baby was born and everything was good until one of Herman's buddies showed up and he brought a gal with him that Trixie just couldn't stand. Everything this woman said just grated on her nerves. And finally, uh, Trixie asked Herman to come up and help her check on the baby upstairs. And so up in the privacy of the nursery, Trixie told Herman exactly what she thought about this other woman and, and also uh, she included a few catty remarks about the other women who were there. And then about the time they got downstairs and rejoined the party, it was strangely silent, except for the cooing of the baby coming from the Wi-Fi powered baby monitor sitting on the end table. Yep, there you go. Words can hurt from upstairs to down. Words can hurt across the globe in some email that gets sent out. Words are incredibly painful. Or words can build people up as well. Our words can offer the grace and kindness of God or they can do incredible damage. Um, Psalm 12, 18. And by the way, please notice the preponderance of scripture that deals with partic this particular topic. Old Testament and New Psalm 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. James 3, 6, the tongue is set among the members as that which defiles, it defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and it's set on fire by hell. That's why our text reminds us as imitators of God's kindness, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there's any good word for edification, that's, that's building up of people. According to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now still, we need to remember, perfection in words is impossible. Okay? And this isn't really an escape clause, but this is just a reality. Perfection in words is impossible. No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison, James 3.8. James, one of the reasons I love James' letter is that it's incredibly practical. And James is practical about the reality. While redeemed, 
I mean, if you've given your life to Jesus, you are redeemed. If you've given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But our redemption is not complete yet. We are in process. So the fact of the matter is, no matter how much we grit our teeth and hold our tongue, even no matter how much we pray, sometimes, somewhere, we're going to say the wrong thing, we're going to say the hurtful thing, we're going to say the thoughtless thing. It's going to happen. So James' warning in this verse here is a call to constant vigilance. We have to guard our tongues. We've been talking about this over the course of these, these messages that have been focused on God's kindness. We've been talking about self-control. Self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It is a specific gift of the Holy Spirit that is intended for all of us. We need to pray for it, and we need to submit ourselves to it, because God can give you the gift of self-control, but you still can decide whether you employ it or not. We pray for it, we submit ourselves to it, and we have to be prepared when necessary to take responsibility and apologize for the sins of our speech. And, I don't know, you're good people. You're not thinking this. You're, you're not thinking this. You're not thinking, well, Skip, this would be an excellent message for those young whippersnappers I hear out there and their foul mouth talk as I hear them going by in the street. You're not thinking that, I'm sure. I'm sure you're not thinking that. Because I'm not just talking about the unwholesome language of those irresponsible youths. I'm also talking about you chronologically enhanced folks, too. Because as we age, sometimes our politeness filters start to wear out. And they start to run out of grace. And they start to run out of gentleness. And that's not or, and again, none of you would think this, but I'll just say it just in case. We might think to ourselves, one might think, all righty then, now that I'm 75 years old, I am free to say whatever I think, and I will do just that as soon as I remember what it is that I wanted to say. I'm sorry, my dears. We have to remember what Jesus said earlier. Um, Matthew 12, again. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. There is no elder exemption. Perfection in our words may be impossible, but we're still going to be held responsible. There's an expectation that we will make the effort. So constant vigilance and a willingness to take responsibility and apologize. Those are critical to our communication. If it's our goal to reflect God's kindness into the world through our words. And God knows we're going to blow it, okay? So that's, that's out there. He knows that we are but dust, but he still calls us to be our best. He calls us to guard our words. He commands us to speak with grace and to speak with gentleness and respect just so that his kindness can be reflected into the world. Finally, this is the thing God's want, God wants. God wants consistent, grace-filled words. That's God's goal. James 3, 9. With it, with the tongue... <clears throat> We bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the image likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send from the same opening fresh and bitter water? Do any of you remember the 90s? The 1990s? I know that it seems a long time ago. But yes, the 90s. 
There was a rabbi, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. He wrote a book called Words That Hurt, Words That Heal. And he put forward the idea of a national speak no evil day. Actually, I have a picture of him. There we go. There he is right there. At speaking engagements, he would ask his audience if, if they could go 24 hours without saying any unkind words about or to anyone. And the response was always nervous laughter, you know, laughter, kind of nervous laughter here and there in the audience. Somebody or somebody's, a few would always say, no way, that kind of a thing. Which set him up to be able to say, those who cannot answer yes must recognize that you have a serious problem. If you cannot go for 24 hours without smoking, you're addicted to nicotine. If you cannot go 24 hours without a drink, you're most likely an alcoholic. Similarly, if you cannot go for 24 hours without saying unkind words, or for our purposes, we can include texting or posting or emailing unkind words about others, then you have lost control of your tongue. The national resolution never came to be, but God's expectations remain firm. The Old and New Testaments agree with today's text, Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there's any good word for edification, according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. We are called to be imitators of God. We're called to reflect God's kindness to the world. And I think you've seen already this morning. The written word of God makes it clear from Genesis all the way to Revelation that God expects us to make every effort to speak no evil. James asks rhetorically, yeah, there it is. Does a fountain send out from the same opening fresh and bitter water? And the answer is, of course not. Of course it doesn't. We cannot come here and sing praise to God, who made humans in his image, and then go home and say or post derisive comments about someone or some people, or, or also, as well, and this is a problem for us these days, or condone the derisive words of someone who says what he thinks, as the saying goes. That's incompatible with the life God expects of you. Words have immense power. They can build up or destroy lives. They, they can even backfire on our own lives and relationships. Controlling our words is hard. It's likely impossible to do it perfectly, but we're called to reflect the kindness of God into the world in all of our words. Spoken and chatted, all the preaching preached and the announcements announced and emails emailed and posts and texts of every sort. Let us guard our words so they will edify and give grace to all who hear or all who read. God calls us to censor ourselves, to pray for self-control, to pray for wisdom in our speech and writing, and that God will guide our words with grace. So we pray, and here I'm asking you all to say this with me. Here we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I want to say that again, all of us together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 1914. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for all these scriptures that tell us about our words and how powerful they are and how dangerous they are and how, how good they can be. Help us to use them. Use them wisely and use them well. Help us to use them to give grace to those who hear us. Help us to use them to edify and to lift up. 
and help us try to take control so that the other kind of speech doesn't slip out of us. Remind us of, of those moments when we're weakest, when, when we might be prone to get upset and say things that we wouldn't normally say in front of the television, on the road. Those kind of things are coming to mind. Help us to watch our language, Lord, and let us speak as led by you and as led by your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper at this point in time. And um, what's going to happen is uh, Daryl's going to play and Rebecca and I will uh, bring the elements around to you. We ask you to hold the elements, both of them, if you would please. And then I'll come sit back down up here and we will partake together. So let us receive the elements in order to celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice for us. We thank you that your death on the cross not only pays the price for our sins, but also 
allows for our redemption in such a way that your own spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside us. And your Holy Spirit living inside us can empower us to the point even of being able to curb our words, to empower them to bring good into the world. We thank you for your sacrifice and for all that it has done for us. On the night on which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. same way following the meal he took the cup he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood drink from it all of you and he said this because every time we eat this bread and drink this cup we announce to the world that we believe his death and resurrection are powerful and effective to secure our salvation until the day he comes again serve with. We give you praise and honor and glory for that today. Wherever we have to be today, Jesus, you be present, please. Lead us and show us. Help our words to be full of grace, seasoned with salt. We ask it in Jesus' name. 